Number 10, John Mack. In the early 90s, a Pulitzer Prize winning psychologist named Dr. John E. Mack made the jump from diagnosing ordinary psychological conditions to researching apparent alien abductees and their stories and experiences surrounding UFOs. Yep. Google it up, it's actually terrifying and very real. Apparently cases studied by Mac and abduction sometimes get involved with hypnosis. This guy was a tenured professor since the 50s at Harvard. He did his research. The UFO abduction rabbit hole led him to interviewing and studying more than 200 people who insist that they were taken. At first he was trying to crack the psychosis of the subject, but after studying and funding from the Rockefellers, private donors and universities, he wrote numerous books on the phenomena and its strangeness. Again, tenured and Pulitzer Prize winner. He sadly passed in 2004 from a drunk driver. His life and death holds heavy conspiracy debate around it. Check it out, it's uh, a little bit strange. Number nine, Sophia. We've seen her on Fallon, we've seen her on breakfast television. She still looks like a bad cyberpunk character, doesn't she? Sophia by Hanson Robotics, the most advanced human-like robot that we have. Well, actually this is like their 12th one. This is the world's first robot citizen. Literally. Not only is she considered a citizen, she has a credit card and a seat in the UN. Like what? In 2016, Sophia premiered on the Jimmy Fallon show playing rock, paper, scissors. Yeah, simple stuff. Two years later, she's harmonizing with Jimmy live. Also, they didn't sing Mr. Roboto. Like, I just feel like that was a huge missed opportunity there. Like, where are the writers, dude? I've seen the Terminator and Ex Machina, and at the Web Summit presentation in 2018, Sophia and her brother Han glitched out on stage and had a terrifying, cryptic, non-coherent conversation, joking about ending the world. Yeah, it's horrifying, you gotta check it out. Dude, I feel like Furbies were their first try, and now they got these like brat dolls mini Sophias coming out soon. Like, where's this going? Number eight, Arthur Flowerdew. James Arthur Flowerdew was born in England in 1906. Grew up, paid his taxes, lived a pretty normal life. At about the age of 12, he began to have strange recurring dreams and hallucinations though. Over time, crystallizing into a very clear and vivid image. Dreams riddled with stone cities, carvings and cliffs, and vast deserts. He didn't understand what it all meant. One day, as an old man, he was watching a documentary on the BBC on the ancient city of Petra in Jordan. He was stunned. This was the city he had always seen. He called the BBC and asked them to interview him. Archaeological experts and the Jordanian government even invited him to come out to Jordan, where he continued to even baffle experts. Flowerdew was able to find his way around the city without a map, giving precise details on landmarks and even pointing out undiscovered locations. Yeah, here's the scary part. After all of this, he was convinced that he had lived an entire previous life in ancient times and was reincarnated in the 20th century. Number seven, Proctor's Ledge. Over 1,000 documents from Salem's witch trials, yet none of the accounts actually specify where the hangings took place. For more than 300 years, it was believed that the 19 people who were accused, tried, and executed in the Salem witch trials of 1692 were hanged at the summit of Gallows Hill. Maps of 1700 Salem show Gallows Hill marked out, but no actual marker of the execution site. Hmm, that's odd. A team of researchers began to reconsider the evidence in 2010 and eventually concluded it was the right spot. Yeah, oopsies. Actually, the real execution spot was called Proctor's Ledge. Also, eerie name for where they hang people, isn't it? It was confirmed in 2016 by scientists after ground penetrating data and writings from 1692 that it wasn't the actual location of the brutality. I know what you're thinking. It's named after John Proctor. No, no it's not. However, really odd timing as he was one of the witches accused of witchcraft. Locals say that the ghost named the Lady in White visits Proctor's Ledge often, which now makes sense with the whole we found the right spot stuff. Visitors claim to have caught sightings of her and even catch her disembodied voice. Yeah. Number six, props. Elmer McCurdy was an American outlaw, running with a small crew, banking and train robbing the Wild West until he was killed in a shootout with sheriffs after robbing a Katy train in Oklahoma in 1911. Famously known as the bandit who wouldn't give up, his mummified body was first put on display at an Oklahoma funeral home before being an amusement, traveling carnival show to carnival show during the 1920s right through the 1960s. After changing ownership several times, McCurdy's remains eventually wound up at the Pike Amusement Zone in Long Beach, California. His corpse was then used as a prop, but then discovered by a film crew on a set of The Six Million Dollar Man. They were positively identified 
in 1976, and the following year, 1977, Elmer McCurdy's body was finally laid to rest at the Summit View Cemetery in Oklahoma. McCurdy's fingers were apparently so damaged that detectives couldn't even pull a fingerprint. The coroners had to x-ray his teeth and measure his bones to ID him. His pockets included a bullet, a Sunny Amusement Museum of Crime ticket, a newspaper article, and a 1924 penny. Yeah, that's terrible. Just weekend at burning him for like 60 years set to set? Not really knowing it's a real body? People will do anything for money, won't they? Number five, Operation High Jump. Operation High Jump, officially named the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, launched in 1946 to 1947. An operation to establish an Antarctic research base organized by Admiral Richard E. Byrd. High Jump included 4,700 men, 13 ships, and 33 aircrafts. The war's end signaled the onset of the atomic age and a desire to secure supplies of uranium. With its almost unlimited mineral deposits, the largely unexplored territory of Antarctica was just the prize. It commenced 1946 and ended in late 1947. Or did it? Also known as Task Force 68, Bird and his team established the Little America 4 base near three previous bases in the ice. The frozen aircrafts would photograph as much of the Antarctic's land surface as possible during this three month operation. Seems like the public thinks that high jump could have been more fishy than we think. Seems like skeptics are leaning towards more of a secret military expedition to the center of the earth type stuff. Yep, apparently there's a mouth to the center of the planet in the Antarctic and there was a secret race to find it. High Jump is still today at the mercy of the internet on whether or not it was a legit project or a secretly funded scientific expedition. Google it up. It's pretty wild and very real. Number four, Ouija boards. Popularized by teens in the 1970s, the Ouija board has earned its reputation over the years. Created almost 100 years before its heightened popularity, the year is 1891. And as the first ads started to appear in papers claiming, quote, Ouija, the wonderful talking board. The title from a Pittsburgh toy and novelty shop. The first paper described it as a magical game that answered questions about the past, present, and future with marvelous accuracy. A flat board with the letters of the alphabet configured in two semicircles. Above, the numbers zero through nine. The words yes and no in the upper corners, goodbye at the bottom. No batteries included nor needed. Now. The origins are pretty messy, and it's hard to kind of pinpoint who or what inspired these early attempts at this game. It kind of just appeared on shelves. No, literally. The Kennard Novelty Company exclusively made and marketed these talking boards, and apparently the lore goes that one of the designer's sisters was a medium and asked the board what it would like to be called. It responded, Ouija, followed by, good luck. Well, that's absolutely terrifying. At least good sportsmanship though, right? Yeah, I've never played with one of these, nor will I ever. That's a no-brainer for me, 100%. Number three, the Philadelphia Experiment. I pray that this one is a hoax because there's a lot of documents that relate to this subject around the time that don't really seem to add up. The Philadelphia Experiment was an alleged event witnessed by Carl Allen and the United States Navy Shipyard in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in October 1943. Allen describes an experiment where the U.S. Navy attempted to render itself invisible, cloaking the destroyer, the USS Eldridge, and the bizarre scientific results that followed. On Allen's account, the destroyer successfully made itself invisible, but the ship inexplicably teleported to Norfolk, Virginia for several minutes and then reappeared back in Philly. Sounds pretty cool, right? So what's the catch? The ship's crew was supposed to have suffered various side effects, including insanity, intangibility, and being frozen in place. Like people stuck in the walls and stuff. Stuck in the floors like this is a scene from Jumanji. Terrifying. The story surfaced in the late 1950s when Allen sent a book full of handwritten letters referring to the experiment to a U.S. Navy research organization. The U.S. Navy maintains that there has been no such experiment ever conducted and that the details are highly exaggerated and falsified. Dude, I hope so, because this is horrifying. Number two, wow. In a 1959 paper, Cornell University physicists speculated that if an extraterrestrial civilization was attempting to communicate with us using radio signals, that they might use a frequency of 1420 megahertz, which is naturally emitted by hydrogen, the most common element in the universe. In 1973, Ohio State University assigned the big ear to the scientific search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1977, Jerry Amon, a SETI volunteer astronomer, was analyzing data and spots a series of signal intensities and frequencies that left him and his colleagues 
astonished. The wow signal was the first signal detected from Earth. The signal came from the direction of the constellation Sagittarius. Eamon discovered the anomaly, impressed by the result. On the computer printout, he circled 6EQUJ5 and wrote three letters beside it. Wow. Leading to the event's famous name. The signal lasted for a full 72 seconds, and it remains today as the strongest candidate for an ET radio transmission ever detected. And number one, of course, the USS Cyclops. Launched in May of 1910, the USS Cyclops was a Protus class collier built for the United States Navy, a huge cargo ship designed for transporting coal. In 1918, the cursed vessel left Rio de Janeiro, heading for Barbados, right around a certain dangerous triangle. Unfortunately, the Voyager was never to be seen again. Named Cyclops after a race of giants from Greek mythology, she was huge and heavy, unmissable by the naked eye. So what happened to her? The loss of the ship and crew still remains the single largest loss of life at sea the United States Navy has ever experienced. Funny thing is, it went right through the Bermuda Triangle, a place where magnetic compasses stop working, ships are never heard from again, and of course, the military still refuses to operate and research. Skeptics are quick to say aliens and black holes, but the magnetism surrounding the Bermuda Triangle cases might be a logical explanation. I think they still owe us some explanations, no? I'm looking at you, Freedom of Information Act. All things Harry, and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France, is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped, and the queen consort was given the choice. Allow her grandson's hair to be cut, or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape, and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times, saying, all right, kill him, instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair, and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with, while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes, using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place, like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum, however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world men shave their heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, the more powerful you're supposed to be. So, as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. And studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent, and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards, though, is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that 
thought was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today, and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lime, or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cold like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, case eating 
didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh, it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus or a gonf stick as well as a torchicule or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, where the torchicule was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw or moss or leaves or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags though when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street as did the live animals in the markets and so did the people. Also animals just kind of died in places and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses and the smell of diseased human or animal skin and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women whipped their put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for Breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays people use q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringe-worthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tool should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little Little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use? Number 10. Mummification. Back in the ancient Egyptian times, of course, mummification was common. And even today, we're finding more mummies. It's pretty exciting. We're uncovering more ancient history every day. But how the hell was mummification done? Obviously, we can't talk about this in school because we're a little too young and maybe it's a little frightening. So, warning, it's a little gross. We've talked about teeth worms and trepidation, so I don't know. I feel like you're prepared. Well, for starters, mummification wasn't cheap. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. Now, it's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you would put a hook in your nose and then you would pull out your um your brains all of the brains and the mushy stuff just right out of your head. And then you would cut the left side of the stomach open, remove all of those goods, all those organs, gone, easy. And then while those are drying, you would put the lungs and the liver in jars. So ancient Egyptians, that's why they needed a lot of jars. You gotta put lungs and organs in it. And then you put the heart back in the body and then wash the insides out with wine and spices, all that good stuff. And then you would cover the body in salt for 70 days. Now around day 40, you would stuff in some sand, and then come day 70, that's when you would wrap them finally in the mummy bandages. And then the sarcophagus finally awaits. Those jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber. So if you watch the mummy and they're, you know, making somebody a mummy and they're like moving around, no, it wasn't like that at all. It took 70 days. It was a long, exhausting process. Number nine, first open heart surgery. Okay, going back to ancient Egyptians, why not? We're on a little track here. So they would clean the entire body out and then they would put the heart back in. Now, of course, they weren't alive during any of this obviously. But when was the first ever open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality after this? Well, the first successful open heart surgery after mummification went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. The surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, he saved this man. 
This is how he did it. In the city's first interracial hospital too, might I add, there weren't many textbooks on this type of operations at the time. So the odds of survival here were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all, being the first. At this point in time, there were no x-rays, no antibiotics, no anesthesia, and also, no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through nerves, muscles, ribs, you name it, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Now, Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted, obviously, to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Yeah, I didn't remember hearing those details in school. Probably would have fainted at my desk. Number eight, Bridget Bishop. Okay, getting some witchy nonsense for this one. Back in 1692, 500 people lost their lives due to smallpox. This happened after Europeans brought the disease to North America, and in result, you would get covered in these sores, these pimple-like bubbles. It was really uncomfortable. So rather than recognize the situation as symptoms from a disease, the people of Salem at first thought, oh, they're probably cursed. They're probably witches. Hence why they're acting odd. The small Massachusetts village began this wave of hysteria with two young women, Betty Paris and Abigail Williams. They started to show signs of the disease. They were convulsing, acting strange, talking nonsense. Obviously, they were extremely ill. And so the village doctor, William Greggs, just said, eh, I think they're bewitched. I think there's a couple of witches in our presence. And then other villagers slowly started to show similar symptoms because, you know, science, that's how it works. But at the time, they believed Bridget was the first ever witch and she was just cursing everybody around her. It was kind of the reason they kicked off the entire Salem witch hunt. It was all because of Bridget Bishop. Over the next few months, around 150 more folks were all convicted, all meeting their similar fate on Gallows Hill. Maybe it was Bridget Bishop or maybe it was just rye disease. It's now referred to as St. Anthony's fire. You convulse, you experience delusions. Feels like bugs are under your skin, it's horrible. But these doctors didn't know that back then. Everybody just thought they were all cursed, that they were witches. No, they were not cursed, they just needed help. Oddly enough, in May 1693, just one year later, the Salem witch trials abruptly stopped. Did the town of Salem run out of witches or did they run out of contaminated rye bread? I vote the latter. I vote the latter, me personally. Number seven, Mail and Matt's daughter. Okay, sometimes in history, humans can be found guilty of practicing witchcraft. This is wild, this was like, Imagine, imagine that today. I've mentioned Giles Corey on this list before. He's a brave soul. But we also have to mention Malin Matt's daughter. She doesn't get the light as much as Giles does. It's one thing for a town to turn against you and call you a witch, but imagine family. That's exactly what happened to Malin Matt's daughter. She was a Swedish widow and her own daughter told everybody that she was a witch. She was the last victim of the great Swedish witch hunt in 1676, also known as the Great Noise. Malin goes down in history because one, it was thankfully the last, one of the last, but two, she never admitted. Yeah, she didn't cry out in pain. She didn't beg for forgiveness. She said all this witchy nonsense was hogwash and she stood by it too. What an OG. She was a champ. She was a badass. Her daughter was actually later found guilty of perjury. So later she met a similar fate. You know what I'm saying? What goes around comes around like a witch flying on a broom in circles. Number six, wedding season. Okay, we'll brighten the mood up a little bit. We'll start going this way in ancient history. Maybe you fantasized about your own big day, right? Maybe it's a beach wedding. Maybe it's a themed wedding, like a winter wonderland. Maybe it's a nice ice palace. It's always fun, I guess. I'm Canadian, so I'm like, no, definitely, but I hear you. It's your big day, okay? Get creative. They say the best month to get married is June. And again, from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must. See, June was the month of the god June. No. And they protect women and life when it comes to marriage and childbirth. So if it's between that and Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June, right? Better omens over here, for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then. So when majority of the population washed up at the end of May or the beginning of June, everybody smelt nice, right? Everyone felt good and they wanted to celebrate. So why not have weddings in this month as well, right after we have a little bubble bath or two. That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. It does make sense. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Yeah, maternity leave? Never heard of it, sorry. Welcome to ancient history. It's the worst. Number five, best man origins. I got asked to be a best man recently, so you know what? I have to share some, some, some love. I have to share some ancient best man love. It was a little different back then, that's for sure. Back in those days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom. That's normal, whether that's a brother or a best friend. Back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different, and it was all about protecting one's assets rather than, you know, anything to do with love. Back then, bride kidnapping was so common that if there was somebody else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to send someone else, they might try and steal her for themselves, right? It's awful. That's where the best man comes in. He's got to 
watch for dudes hopping fences ready to steal your wife and run away. The best man's job was to protect the bride at all costs. And if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. That's wild. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure she didn't try and make a run for it as well. It sounds okay at first and then you're like, oh no, it's all horrible. History, of course. Number four, ancient divorce. Eh, it happens sometimes. Weird. Almost like those marriages I just uh, explained wouldn't work out all the time. Weird. Trial by combat. You've probably heard of this, right? We've all seen that Game of Thrones episode. The eyes and the... Huh. Yeah, that's a good one. That was the norm, right? You fight for your freedom. But what about divorce by combat? You ever heard of this? If you and your significant other weren't getting along back in the dark ages, instead of dishing out thousands on couples therapy and signing all that paperwork, instead, you would battle each other in front of a crowd because why not? It's the medieval times. It was an organized event that included restrictions for the husband. Now it's pretty hilarious to think back on, but the husband would have to stand in a hole with one hand tied behind his back, while the wife, soon to be happy ex-wife, ran around in circles around said hole, also carrying a sack full of rocks, hitting the ex-husband with the rocks the whole time. Yeah, Pretty intense and also pretty hilarious to think of. Yeah, that's why you don't cheat in the dark ages, Lancelot. Get out of here. A sack of rocks? Just take the castle, take the horse. I don't care, I'm out. I'll sign anything. I'll stamp anything. Number three, the battle of the stray dog. Okay, now we're gonna go back into some weird battles that we probably missed in school. I grew up with dogs my whole life, okay? It's stressful at times. You open the door for a second and all of a sudden your furry friends are running down the street after a blue jay and your heart's racing. Since the second Balkan War in the early 1900s, Greece and Bulgaria were going head to head, right? At this point, there was a lot of conflict, a lot of emotions, tensions were of course high. But come October 1925, things finally escalated even more. A Greek soldier was chasing after his dog, who just decided to bolt randomly. But in doing so, he accidentally crossed the border into Bulgaria. So he was shot at, right? It was scary. The Greeks at that point were beyond upset, so they marched into Bulgaria and soon began a full-on war. All because of this dog who saw a blue jay probably. By the time the international committee negotiated a ceasefire to clear up the obvious misunderstanding, 50 people had already lost their lives. So yeah, keep those leashes on, please, unless you're in a off-leash dog park. Cause you might start a war, you never know. Number two, the Battle of Los Angeles. Of course I have to mention this battle. This one's a little bit different, but you know, maybe some UFO stuff going on here. The Battle of Los Angeles, otherwise known as the Great LA Air Raid, happened during World War II, right at the end of February, 1942. This event, first of all, it took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack. So yeah, everybody was of course immensely stressed out at this point. And then something like 25 enemy aircraft was then spotted flying over LA. In the late hours of February 24th. So now everyone's freaking out. Air raids went off, blackouts were in effect. This was not a drill, right? Right? Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells. In total, around 1,400 shells were all fired off. Two people had heart attacks. Five people died in total from this retaliation. And it was all a false alarm. Yep. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Yeah. Huh, oops. Thought I heard a noise, my bad, we'll just close that. No one touches anymore, I guess. War nerves. And finally, number one, Battle of Zappolino. This one is pretty epic, okay. All over a bucket. Turning the calendars back to 1325, the Battle of Zappolino, it was a large scale event all over a tiny bucket. And no, I'm not joking. The War of the Oaken Bucket. Now this war consisted of two Italian towns, Bologna and Medina. Now it all kicked off when soldiers from Medina snuck into Bologna with intentions to steal. To steal the wooden bucket from the city's well. Right? Resources were sparse back then, of course, so the Bolognese declared war, and then they sent in an invading force of 30,000 foot soldiers and 2,000 cavaliers. The city of Modena had a smaller army. They had 500 infantrymen and only 2,000 cavalry forces. But the thing is, those guys still won. They chased the larger army back to Bologna while destroying towns in the process. Now, some recall them bringing the bucket back just to taunt the city, but right now the bucket is currently on display still in Modena. So it ended up finding its forever home there. Number 10, Treaty of Verdun. The Treaty of Verdun, or also known as Traite de Verdun was a contract agreed on in August 843 in which divided the Frankish Empire into three kingdoms among the surviving sons of the Emperor Louis I. The firstborn son and heir of Charlemagne. Long story short, 
All the grandsons were all at civil war with each other about who was getting what, what did Grant promise. The treaty followed shortly after almost three years of wars between the brothers. It was the first in a series of partitions contributing to the dissolution of Charlemagne's empire and it is seen as a blueprint in which modern societies are based off of. Basically the brothers all had to split what their grandfather had decreed his own into land. Lothair, the first, coolest name, Charlemagne's eldest son, received Francia Media, or the Middle Frankish Kingdom. Louis II received Francia Orientalis, or the East Frank Kingdom. And Charles II received Francia Occidentalis, or the West Frankish Kingdom. You and I both know the youngest got the most. Come on, I'm just gonna say it right out. Everyone likes to talk about the eldest son this and the eldest son that, but we all know the baby gets whatever they want whenever they want, don't they, huh? I'm looking at you, Taylor. Come here, man. It's true, man. The baby gets everything. Middle child? This guy didn't even exist growing up. Didn't hear from him. Number nine, Underground Castle. Big Chet and I are currently replaying Ocarina of Time, so in honor of Hyrule, I gotta include this medieval castle. It was once a residence during the reign of King Henry III. This castle was actually discovered recently underneath a prison yard back in 2015. The old prison castle, we love those. Shawshank Redemption 2, medieval edition. Super recent discovery. Archaeologists discovered walls of a castle underneath the basketball court in southwest England at a former prison. Yeah, dudes were shooting threes over top of kingdom and they had no idea. How amazing is that? This was the same castle that played part in the mid 1100s during England's civil war. The castle actually fell later in the 1400s and the prison was built on the grounds later in the 1700s until it closed its gates forever in 2013. And then we were shooting threes and then we discovered it, of course. If I was a ghost haunting these grounds, I would make Make every shot miss easily. I would just float near the net, tap the ball away. Like, nice try. Mm. Back to prison. Mm. Number eight. Stone masonry. So we all know about who wrote what and who translated what to what text and which language while writing what play, which was based on who, but who built all this stuff? When we think of the Dark Ages, we can't forget the megalithic Leviathan stones carved and molded together to create the enormous Gothic castles and cathedrals that are still standing to this day. How did people do it back then? Well, masons in medieval England were responsible for building. Masons were highly skilled craftsmen, and their trade was primarily used in the building of castles, churches, and cathedrals. There were three main classes of stonemasons. There was the apprentice, the journeyman, and the master mason. So what would a medieval construction site exactly look like? Well, of course, there's the master mason. He's usually the head and the overseer of the work, and he's the most skilled of the tradesmen. This was like the head honcho on site. We've all seen this guy walking around site. He's always angry, he's always yelling, hey, who's got the plans? You, give me those. What are these? Eh, yeah, they're backwards, you idiot. I would have put the window down there. So how did they exactly chisel out all of these castles from one giant rock? Well, they didn't. The stone had to be quarried first from quarrymen. These were not masons. Their job was to get the stone for the masons to work on out of the ground. Local stone was used first, but occasionally stone could travel vast distances, even from other countries. And so I gotta drag that boulder there all the way to Scotland? Okay. Some of the most beautiful architecture ever created can be still seen across Europe. The amount of time and skill it took for these people to have designed, constructed, and chiseled such megalithic sites still baffles me. I'd be trying to read the plan still. Oh, I s that's north. I got the, I got it. We're good. Number seven, apple bobbing. In a time where bodies were literally piling up on the side of the road, I can't believe we got apple bobbing out of the whole ordeal. That's crazy. It seems like ill timing, but it is the dark ages. What can you do? Apples historically have always been a symbol of importance. The Greek golden apple started the Trojan War. Snow White's poison apple was a symbol of importance in literature and all that good stuff and growing up. And in the middle ages, apples were viewed as a symbol of romance and fertility. These things have roots, pun intended, of course. In medieval times, bobbing for apples was flirty. It was their version of speed dating, dare I say. What happened was all the leftover apples from the big harvest were then put into a big bucket. Each apple had a villager's name on it, and then maidens would have three chances. Three chances to grab that apple with their teeth. Three chances to win a date with the English Tad Hamilton. What a weird time. Can you imagine if this was in Game of Thrones? Reek is just shivering for two seasons, bobbing for Ramsay's Bolton apples. We're like, medieval times were dark, holy sh**. Number six. The feudal system, AKA feudalism, was a form of structure system existing in medieval Europe in which people would work and fight for nobles who gave them protection and land in return. A social political system in which landowners would contractually bind tenants to exchange their goods, loyalty, and simple space for safety and comfort within the laws of those ruling. Basically, this is like our renter's agreement now. I'll give you a place to stay and some heat. You give me an unfathomable and overpriced amount of shillings for these 
extremely low ceilings. Yeah, talk about crooks, man. This system stayed in place for more than a thousand years and managed to fizzle its way out of society somewhere in the 15th century. Not just anybody would ask to be signed to this deal. There was structure and there was order. There was a lord, AKA, the landowner, aka your landlord, allowing vassals, aka tenants, to rent the land by providing services, especially military services. Yeah, you can stay here, but once in a while, we're gonna need you to dump a bunch of boiling water and over that wall. Is that cool? Yeah, you're fine with that. The plot of land, called a fief, was typically worked on by serfs who were laborers who had very few rights and were bound to the land itself. These were the lowest class of people and they basically did any and all to stay safe on the Lord's land. Jobs would include farming, jobs would include cleaning, and was a minimum of three days work to maintain in good standing and remain stationary. Ah, sure, there was no dental or mental health days, but come on, a three day work week? Plant a couple carrots here and there? Hey, it doesn't seem that bad. Number five, fear the dead. With The Walking Dead on their 47th season, I think it's time to take a peek into zombie history, shall we? And find out where this grim idea really started. Well, it's certainly not a new one, I'll tell you that for free. As far back as the early 1300s, residents were buried in the village of Warren Percy, where archeologists discovered them many moons later, and they discovered marks on their bones. Cuts, burn marks, you name it. Apparently this was all done after they had passed away. But why? Scientists believe that these injuries inflicted after their untimely death were to prevent them from being reanimated. You know, coming back to life and haunting your village. To keep them in their graves, of course. Unless this dude did something to piss off an entire village that much, they were clearly afraid of this corpse coming back to haunt them. Number four. Studia Generali. This period also saw the birth of what we call the modern university. This was a culmination of material translated and taught to provide a new infrastructure to scientific scholars. Some of these new universities were registered by the Holy Roman Empire as an institution of international excellence, giving it the title Studium Generali, or better known as Studia Generale. Most of the early Studia Generale were discovered in Italy, Spain, England, and France. These places of study were considered the most prestigious places of learning in all of Europe. I bet you the school hoodies were still so expensive. Just someone's old textbook with a mustache drawn on Marcus Aurelius. The list and number of institutions began to grow as new universities were founded throughout Europe. As early as the 13th century, scholars from the Studia Generale were encouraged to speak and lecture courses at other institutions within Europe to share documents and information which led to the current academic culture seen in modern universities today. It's a TED talk, come on. There had to be one cool professor back then, like the guy who lets the class teach itself, orders pizza, has tenure, and hates the monarchy. Number three, medieval taverns. Say you wanna grab a pint with the local lads. Where do you get an IPA in the dark ages? Where do we get a six pack of Arthurian ale? Well, this is the medieval ages, so instead of venturing through the woods to hopefully maybe find another town, just ask thy neighbor. That's right, in the Middle Ages, you could brew your own ale. No problem, no one's asking any questions. Give it a shot. In the late 12th century, baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Uh, I guess that's great. So the higher ups, the noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party, but if you made a weak ale or it was improperly measured and then distributed, then and only then do you get a fine. Arrest this man at once. Number two, St. Patrick. St. Patrick was a fifth century Roman British Christian missionary and bishop in Ireland. Also known as the apostle of Ireland, although he is the first apostle, having lived prior to the current laws of the Catholic Church. He is considered a saint in the Catholic Church and is regarded as the Enlightener of Ireland. The dates of Patrick's life are not certain, but there is a consensus that he was active in Ireland during the fifth century, making his rounds as a missionary, speaking the good word of God. But let's get into what everyone talks about with this guy. The good stuff, like slamming a green Guinness or getting all the snakes out of Ireland. I mean, I love the structure and the faith and stuff, but also chasing every snake out of an entire country with a walking stick? Shoo, shoo, you fool, you bleeding bleeder, go, go. Do you know how big Ireland is? St. Patrick's Day is on March 17th, the supposed date of his death in 461 AD. It is enjoyed inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday and remains a celebration of Ireland itself. And finally, number one, dancing plague. A medieval plague, but make it groovy. Yeah, let's start dancing. That's right, the dancing plague. This was a real danger back in 1518. I'll try not to laugh but it's, I can't, I'll try. This was perhaps one of the weirdest events in history. Fra Trofea was the first victim of said plague. She was moving her body around frantically, so much so that it resembled a dance or something, in the middle of the Holy Roman Empire. And as if that wasn't weird already, dozens of others began to join. And then more, and then more. All moving their bodies with a similar, wacky, frantic twist. 
This was long before Chubby Checker came along, so we still have no idea what was going on here. Like, we're out of guesses at this point. This twist lasted for months. People were dropping on the spot. It was scary and confusing. In total, there were around 400 victims that fell to this mysterious illness. That's a lot of deaths. That's a lot of real deaths. This was documented in 16th century historical records, so I don't think the story is made up per se. No one would make this up. It's terrifying. A Catholic saint at the time, Saint Vitus, was believed to have the power to curse people with said dancing plague. What an amazing power also. Guy starts moonwalking away, you're like, beat it! Some suggest this was a cult, others believe they ate toxic rye. At number 10, 18 month winter. If you live anywhere that gets harsh winters, then you know how annoying that it can be. Living in Canada, we know that all too well, and I can personally say that I despise winter. It basically lasts six months out of the year. If a six month winter sounds bad, then imagine how horrible an 18 month winter would be. In 1536 BCE, winter lasted a whole 18 months. Based on archaeological records, a thick dust veil and darkened skies caused temperatures to drop significantly in Europe and parts of Asia. This created some pretty frosty summers and harsh winters for those living in the area at the time. It is believed that this was all caused by a volcanic eruption that shot dust particles into the air and they didn't dissipate for a long time. This phenomenon wasn't just a minor inconvenience to people though, and it greatly impacted the lives of many. It is believed that about a third of Europe's population was wiped out and death rates soared to about 90% in northern regions. It was quite the catastrophe. Alright, number nine, Andrew Jackson. You know when you get so frustrated with someone, you just like take over and like do it yourself? You're like, come on, just, just let me do it. Well, that's probably exactly what went through Andrew Jackson's brain when he was about to be assassinated because it was so poorly done. He survived two point blank assassination attempts by the same guy, seconds apart. It was a cold, wet day in January in 1835, and Richard Lawrence waited behind a pillar inside the Capitol Rotunda. The aging president was there to attend a funeral, of all things, and Lawrence wanted to add one more body. He leapt from behind the pillar and fired. A loud bang went off, but the powder failed to ignite. Fail number one. Andrew was not pleased, and despite his aging form he was using a cane, he went at him with said cane. Lawrence quickly grabbed another pistol, and the same thing happened again. Misfire. Wow. You got so close, dude, and you really messed that up. During the trial, it was confirmed that Lawrence was indeed insane and thought he was the true king of England. And according to him, the only thing standing in his way to achieving like true power was Andrew Jackson. At number eight, Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami. Imagine a great wave of sticky syrup flooding your town. What would you do? Run? Hide? Have a quick snack? Well, for people in Boston in 1915, they didn't have enough time to think about those things when the Boston Toffee Apple Tsunami happened. On January 15, 1915, a 90-foot wide cast iron cask full of 2.5 million gallons of molasses suddenly exploded. The explosion caused a wall of molasses to shoot about 15 feet high at around 35 miles per hour. This sticky situation ended up destroying buildings, carried vehicles, and even drowned people and their horses. It is said that the Boston Toffee Apple tsunami killed about 21 people and injured 150. As people started to come into the hospital after the incident, witnesses recalled the victims looking like toffee apples, which is where the name for the event came from. It took the city weeks to clean up the molasses, but even for years following the incident, people said that they could still smell the molasses in the air on a hot day. Number seven, the big package. Okay, so technically this didn't happen. But it almost did. And the fact that it was even in the works, the fact that someone even thought of this and was like, yeah, that'll show the Russians. So ridiculous. No one really won the Cold War, but everyone has their perspective. But even today, the tensions between America and Russia are like pretty taut. Rather than all out trench warfare, the Cold War consisted of espionage and psychological warfare on both sides. The CIA had many plans, and one of them may surprise you. In the 1950s, Frank Wisner took over the OPC, the central part of the CIA. He sketched out the idea of how to really emasculate the Russians. Under his leadership, they drafted out a plan to drop massive condoms labeled medium to make them think that the US was superior to them, all based on the size of their John Thomases. Because when it comes to deciding whether or not to nuke another country, size matters. They would make the Russians bow to their superior sexual prowess of American men. Oh, sorry, I just almost knocked myself out with that eye roll. Whoa. 
Needless to say, the plan never came to fruition. At number six, Rabbit Army. Weird question, but if you had to choose one animal to fight an army of, which animal would you choose? Well, whatever you choose, make sure it's not rabbits, because as fun as you think an army of rabbits might be, apparently they can be quite fearsome. In 1807, after signing the Treaties of Tilts, Napoleon wanted to celebrate a bit and he wanted to organize a rabbit hunt. He asked his chief of staff to organize the hunt and apparently he went way overboard with the bunnies. Instead of rounding up a couple dozen rabbits, this man said, oh, you want rabbits? All right, bet. And he got 3,000 rabbits. 3,000 rabbits! The rabbits were released into an open field for the hunt and people thought that they would just flee and run away. But instead, the rabbits ganged up on Napoleon and his crew and the bunnies charged at them. But don't worry, these bunnies didn't have a vengeance. They were just trying to make friends. You see, the chief of staff ended up getting tame farm rabbits and they were already used to humans, so they just wanted to say hi. But could you imagine those first few moments of having 3,000 rabbits chasing after you? All right, number five, the Great Whiskey Fire. Now we talked about the molasses explosion. This is kind of similar, but also I can't believe it. I love when bartenders set your drink on fire like they're magicians, like. But the Great Whiskey Fire is nowhere close to an outstanding whiskey sour dressed up in a coop. In Dublin in 1875, 5,000 barrels of whiskey were ignited and made a river of fire in the streets of Dublin. The fire started at Malone's Malt House on Chamber Street where the barrels were being stored. Once the fire touched the barrels, obviously they exploded into a whiskey lava river of death. Unless you love a hot toddy, that is. I know a hot toddy is made with rum. I just, you know, you could, you could also use whiskey. Anyways. All you could basically do was run. It was like, it set fire to everything it touched. Water, sand, gravel were all useless against it, so Captain James Robert Ingram, the head of the fire brigade, suggested horse manure, and miraculously that worked, but imagine the smell. It was the most destructive fire in the history of Dublin, and 13 people died. As terrifying as this sounds, no one died from burns or suffocation from smoke inhalation. As the city was succumbing to the fire, crowds gathered around the pool of whiskey with pots, pans, hats, and boots to collect some for themselves. The people that did die, died because they got alcohol poisoning from drinking the contaminated whiskey from the street. I shouldn't laugh at that, I'm sorry. You can't make this stuff up. It's one of the reasons Irish and whiskey go hand in hand. I mean, what? Don't drink whiskey that's a lava street covered in horse manure. Don't do that. At number four, blue eyes. The 1986 Chernobyl disaster is one of, if not the worst, nuclear disaster in history. The explosion was caused by a flawed reactor that was being operated on by inexperienced workers. The initial disaster took the lives of 31 people and almost half a million people were evacuated from the area. So many lives were affected by the disaster and the intense nuclear radiation. The firefighters who battled the fires from the explosion were some of the most affected by the radiation and it's almost unbelievable what happened happened to their physical appearances because of the exposure. According to records, their skin started peeling off and their eyes turned bright blue. One of the Chernobyl firefighters who was affected by the nuclear radiation had his eyes go from dark brown to light blue. He was so heavily affected by the radiation that when he was buried, he was put into a coffin sealed with zinc to counteract the radiation. All right, this one's super cute and you might die, so get ready. Number three, Sergeant Stubby. I already know this movie is gonna make me cry. Dogs, man. If dogs are in movies, I'm done. We really don't deserve dogs, okay? We don't. Sergeant Stubby was actually a real heroic doggo. While training for combat in 1917, Private Robert Conroy found a little brindle puppy with a short tail. He named him Stubby, and little did he know that he would become a decorated war hero. Stubby became their mascot for the 26th Yankee Division, 102 Infantry. He learned bugle calls, the drills, and even like a little donkey salute. He would lift his right paw and just salute his head, and was the only animal allowed at camp. Conroy snuck him aboard the SS Minnesota, and the crew was won over by him, obviously, because he was so cute. How could you not? They brought him to the front lines and Stubby saved life after life. He woke soldiers during a gas attack. He rescued fallen soldiers on the battlefield by following the sound of English calls. He could distinguish the languages. He even captured an enemy spy. After this incident, he was promoted to Sergeant Stubby. Because how can you not? He captured an enemy spy. He did his job. Sergeant Stubby served and survived 17 battles, staying with Conroy even until after the war. He finally passed away in 1926, his service complete. 
complete. All right, at number two, Huberta the Hippo. You've probably never heard of Huberta the Hippo, South Africa's most famous hippo, so I'm going to tell you about her and what made her so extraordinary. In 1928, Huberta the Hippo walked 1,600 kilometers or 1,000 miles, traveling from her home in the St. Lucia estuary to East London. Huberta became quite the celebrity on her journey as she drew in large crowds of people wanting to see her and give her food. Along her journey, she even stopped at a country club, a theater, and even the beach. After failing to capture Huberta, she was officially declared royal game, meaning no one could harm her. Sadly, however, just a month after arriving in East London, she was shot by a couple of farmers. People were so upset that these farmers harmed Huberta that they demanded their arrest. The farmers were arrested and fined 25 pounds, which was a lot back then because it was the Great Depression. Huberta's body was given to a taxidermist in London, and in 1932, Huberta's body was sent back to South Africa, where thousands of people gathered to welcome her home. Number one, last but not least, Ching Shi. I love Pirates of the Caribbean. It's my jam. Pirate. Yee. Yeah. Before I knew how bad pirates would actually smell in real life, Jack Sparrow loved him, but really couldn't get like six feet next to him. He would have smelled so bad. But a movie series seriously needs to be made about Ching Shi. Her story is incredible. She became known as the terror of South China due to her massive fleet of over 50 to 70,000 pirates. She started out working as a woman of the night until one night she met Cheng Yi, the pirate captain who ruled over the red flag fleet. The captain proposed to her and she said yes under the condition that they would share the power of the fleet and the plunder. Together, they launched a fleet of over 1,800 ships. They were highly organized, ruthless, and disciplined. Sadly, six years into their marriage, her husband died, leaving Ching Shi alone to rule. She ran a tight ship, handing out fierce punishments to all those who disobeyed her orders. She was strict with her prisoners, keeping her men in check should any woman be taken in. Should they take a wife, fine, but they had to remain faithful. If they didn't, well, dead. If they took a woman against her will, dead. Any who deserted would be hunted down and tortured, then killed. The Red Fleet eventually felt like a floating country, even routinely taxing villages. The Chinese government eventually realized they couldn't do Number 10, Hotel Speed. Okay, picture this. You're young and in a hotel with your parents. Maybe it's a vacation, maybe it's a trip, or maybe it's a hockey game, nice. Nonetheless, you find yourself in a long hallway with a strange looking carpet. Hotel hallways always have weird carpets, I don't know. Maybe it's the giant hamburger and milkshake you just ate. Maybe it's the hotel TV or the excitement of just not being at home. But something has changed. You're different. Your powers have been amplified. For this corridor will be your personal racetrack. A shame Guinness World Records isn't here to clock you in at max speed because for some reason if you fly down that hallway any faster, the rug would catch fire. Yes, the joys of running down a hotel hallway. This is probably how the first Olympians felt at the first Olympic Games. I'm comparing it to that for some reason, sure we'll go with it. Where the only event at these Olympic Games was running. Like many of the other events that would later come later on, this was done without clothing, which is fine. As long as you're, you know, not doing that in the hotel hallway. Keep clothes on. Number nine, WWE, brother. Only if you could have seen the look on my face when I discovered that wrestling in the WWE isn't as real as I thought it was. The shock, the confusion, and the loud ringing in my ear. It really, it was pretty serious for me. I got really into it as a kid. It gave me some Vietnam flashbacks, seriously. You mean to tell me that there was an intricate planning into every hit and fall, every entrance, and every time we heard the sound of a steel chair connecting with someone's forehead? Oh man. As a kid, I never would have guessed that, but when The Undertaker walks in a room, you take notice. Those thoughts just go away. Sadly, the ancient Greeks did not have cage matches, turnbuckles, or personas based on hyper male confidence. What they did have, however, was some real wrestling, some bare knuckle, no clothes, oiled up kind of wrestling. Nice. Instead of a one leg up pin, a scoring system was used for when the opponent's body was on the ground. And I'm sure lots of people got injured in the process. Whew, no thanks. I'll stick to the cage matches. Number eight, Pankration. 
here's another story for you. It might seem kind of silly, but growing up, I got to witness the birth of a mainstream sport. The UFC got its start in the early 90s, but blew up in the mid 2000s. Now, I'm not much of a sports guy. Besides major championship matches or games, I don't really watch any sports. I'm more of a film and video game guy, if you couldn't tell. However, my first interaction with the UFC was seeing an octagon shaped ring, and my grade 2 geometry immediately kicked in and said, that, that's an octagon. Wow, okay, that's different. However, the second thing that I noticed is that this was not wrestling, and this wasn't boxing. It was kind of a mixture of both. Sort of a mixed martial art, if you will. Well, that's kind of what Pank Ration was. There was no indirect punching or kicking, but pretty much anything else goes. To me, this sounds like a good way to get injured. Kind of like wrestling before, now it's just even worse. And as I'm sure you all know, paper cuts can be lethal back then, so maybe not such a good idea. Did I mention this is done without clothes too? There's, everyone's, everyone's naked. Number seven, the road trip. This isn't an Olympic event, but honestly, it should have been. Think about it for a minute. I want you guys to look out the nearest window right now. Get up, go ahead, look out the nearest window. Tell me what you see. You probably see a road with cars. When you need a fast food fix, it's as simple as getting in a car and driving on the road to your destination. Or getting it delivered with your favorite food delivery app. It's 2022, we can do a lot of crazy stuff now. What I'm getting at is that people from all over the Greek city states came to Olympia to witness the first Olympics. Except, you know, it would have been a triathlon just to get there. Frankly, my biggest fear, walking. That was the main mode of transportation, which after a while in those sandals was probably hell. Imagine trekking many, many miles by land and sea to only be exhausted to watch athletes become exhausted. Oh, I need some water just thinking about it. Woo. Number six, peace. Peace. What's better than a good war? A better armistice, or at least I'd like to hope so. During these first Olympic Games, which on a side note, if I had a time machine and a scooter, I'd love to see firsthand. There was people and athletes coming from all corners of Hellenistic civilization, all Greek states and colonies. Well, sometimes these Greek states got caught up in these little things called wars. Who knew, right? But when the Olympics were on, a truce was called. Messengers were dispatched to announce the truce, which gave all the people traveling on their long treks safe passage. I also find it somewhat amusing that they did this all for one day. That's right, the events only lasted one day. Some folks did days of traveling only to have it all be over in 24 hours. The opening ceremony couldn't have taken that long either, so I feel like it's kind of a waste of time. Only if we got some of that peace right now. Russia is looking at Ukraine a certain kind of way, just, just waiting to act up. Bad Russia, stay in your corner. Number five, tanks. Okay, so after a few Olympics, people got tired of walking those many, many miles just to see some dudes run a mile. We need more events, said the Olympic organizers, but what? We have athletes running, what else is there? Okay, okay, I hear you. What if we get athletes to run but with full military armor and gear on. Yeah, that's right. There was another race where athletes would wield the armor of the Greek soldiers and race. I can imagine that there was a clunking noise, or at least a lot of it. And also, how difficult it must be to run in bronze armor. I'm gonna let you guys in on a little secret. Come a little closer. A little closer. A little closer. Whoa, too close. Bronze armor isn't good for chafing. Cause let me tell you something, hot Mediterranean sun, not a lot of water, and running in hot metal attire? Someone's gonna have to come over and put baby powder on my bum bum. Number four, the classic. I don't know why, but when I think of ancient Greeks, I think of grapes on the vine, marble, chariots, and, and the movie 300. It's, it's kinda hard to forget those spray on abs. Although someone could put them on me, it'd be kinda nice. Equestrian events were another event of the ancient Greek Olympics, and I have something nice to say about something for once. While every other event was dominated by males, because, well, only males were allowed to compete, of course, the equestrian events allowed women. Nice! And naturally, ladies, when someone points the spotlight on you, you shine. A notable winner of the event was Sinisica, a Spartan princess and athlete who was an excellent horse breeder. I guess that's a nice thing to be remembered by. According to some records, two monuments were built in honor of her victory. I rode a horse once. I can firmly say that I prefer the automobile. Just saying. You walk around like that, that's why all the cowboys walk like this. You just do that all that. Number three, the long jump. After running and running in armor, it was discovered that jumping makes for a great Olympic event. 
How high? How far? It's simple, really. It should come as no surprise that I did not perform well in that section of track and field day at school. To my disadvantage, there was no strength-based events because it was considered unhealthy for us because we were so young. Yeah, I wasn't sure about that. My counter to that argument would be, why are you making tubby kids run the 1500 meter? That's liable to have the kid with asthma writing his math test in the hospital bed later. I'd probably be joining him. However, I am a supporter of the Ancient Greek jumping event. Basically, athletes gotta jump as far as they can whilst holding two large rocks. Now, if we did that today, people would know what it's like to do a long jump when grandma feeds you too much. Yeah, it's not easy. Number two, the discus, the javelin, and the hammer. Sounds like a good band. Hey, these are all events that we still compete in today. That's awesome. But doesn't it make you nervous when the athletes are throwing those bad boys around? Especially the hammer throw. God, it just makes me so nervous. While I couldn't find an exact example of an accident happening, I doubt the ancient Greeks had safety in mind for spectators. The discus was made from stone or bronze, and they were tossing those suckers the same way Guy Fieri tosses Caesar salad which is a lot because he's kind of a big guy too. However, for me, it's the javelin that's most terrifying, as that was an appropriate weapon of war for the time. And athletes are just throwing them around like it's nothing. You're telling me the crowd was a safe distance away from the splash zone? Yeah, just keep your eye on the sky to be safe, folks. I don't know about that. Number one, rap battle. Honestly, this is something we should bring back to the Olympics. While I was complaining about not being able to compete in strength-based events earlier, I, as a theater kid, would have much preferred some of the other less intensive events the ancient Greeks had up to offer. The ancient Greeks were not just chucking stones and chafing in bronze armor. There was also a competition with the arts, poetry, song, and singing. Imagine if America entered Eminem into a rap battle contest. There would be no contest. Imagine if Canada entered one for musicians. KD Lang, Celine Dion. For number 10 spot today, we have lobotomies. Did you know that it used to be common practice for people to just get a part of their brain cut out? Okay, well maybe not common, but it wasn't as uncommon as you would hope. Lobotomies used to be considered an excellent and efficient cure for things such as mental health problems, which thankfully is a practice that has not survived for a very good reason. Of course, in modern medicine, lobotomies still exist, but only when actually necessary. And there is of course a lot more knowledge about the dangers and effects. One well-known person to have undergone one of these procedures was Rosemary Kennedy, who was John F. Kennedy's sister. She was experiencing seizures as well as mood swings and while these seizures certainly were something that needed to be looked after for her health, I'm not sure if the mood swings necessarily needed some kind of medical intervention. Anyways, to quote unquote cure her, they had a lobotomy performed on her. This procedure left her with the mental capacity of a two-year-old and she could no longer speak or walk properly. After this, she spent most of her life hidden away and it was thought that her family did this because they were ashamed of her, which is both horrible and so sad. In our number nine spot today, we have the posthumous execution. Okay, so this is something that has actually happened more than once, but I just found out it's happened at all, and I'm both slightly confused and absolutely disgusted at the idea, so I needed to share one example with you guys. So there was a man named Oliver Cromwell, who Wikipedia describes as, quote, an English general and statesman who, first as a subordinate and later as commander-in-chief, led armies of the Parliament of England against King Charles the first during the English Civil War, subsequently ruling British Isles as Lord Protector from 1653 until his death in 1658. So in 1658, Oliver passed away fairly suddenly and his son Richard became Lord Protector, but because he now had a power base in Parliament or the army, he had to resign just the following year, which effectively ended the Protectorate. Since there was no clear leadership during this time, George Monk was able to have the long Parliament restored. He then made some slight constitutional Constitutional adjustments so that Charles II could be invited back from exile in 1660 and actually be a king under a restored monarchy. So then on January 30th, 1661, on what was the 12th anniversary of the execution of King Charles I, Oliver's body was exhumed and executed posthumously. They killed a dead guy. I get that it's like symbolic, but it's just like a little redundant, don't we think? Anyway, his head was cut off and displayed outside of Westminster Hall 
Hall until 1685. Afterwards, it had a series of different owners, which only adds to the oddity of the story. In our number eight spot today, we have Agent Orange. Agent Orange is not Cody Banks' cousin, but it was an extremely potent herbicide used from 1961 to 1971 in the Vietnam War. It was intended to cut through the canopy of thick foliage in Vietnam in order to reveal the troops underneath, but instead it proved to be extremely deadly to humans. It caused cancers, birth defects, and so many more different health issues. It's not like it was just a little bit either. 21 million gallons of it were sprayed over Vietnam, which affected hundreds of thousands of Vietnamese citizens, and it also affected the US veterans who faced exposure as well. While this is a dark part of history and it's really difficult to hear about, it's also important that we don't forget things like this. Knowing our history is so important so we don't make the same mistakes again. In our number seven spot today, we have the Red Summer. The Red Summer is something I didn't even hear mentioned in school, which is honestly absolutely shocking. I'm hoping this is something that is more commonly taught than I think it is, because it really is important. The Red Summer is the term used to refer to the period from the late winter through to the early autumn of 1919, in which white supremacist terrorism and racial riots took place in more than three dozen cities across America. Some of the more well-known race riots that took place during during the Red Summer were the Chicago, Washington, D.C. riots. These anti-black riots are said to have developed from a multitude of post-World War I tensions, such as the economic slump and the competition in job and housing markets. In 1919, it certainly wasn't uncommon for there to be race riots and a multitude of white-on-black violence, but the Red Summer really marked some of the first race riots in which black people in number stood up to the white supremacy, resisted, and fought back. During the Red Summer, a civil rights act activist named A. Philip Randolph publicly defended the right of black people to self-defense. It is said that between January 1st and September 14th of 1919, white mobs left at least 43 black Americans, but despite this, the states refused to interfere or prosecute these mobs. Considering how many race riots went on during this summer, we truly could dedicate an entire video to the Red Summer. It is insane to think about how recent 1919 really was, and while we certainly have come a long way, there's always more work to be done and part of the work involves us learning about these horrible histories and what has happened in our past. In our number six spot today we have King Gojian of Yu. King Gojian of Yu had his reign from 496 BC until 465 BC. His reign took place during what was arguably the last major conflict of the spring and autumn period and he was able to lead his state to victory but it certainly wasn't an easy road or without some very creepy happenings. The major conflict he led his state through was the war between Wu and Yu, which started when a Yu princess, who was married to a prince of Wu, left her husband and fled back to Yu. I mean, this of course wasn't the only thing that caused the war, but it certainly sparked the fire. The king was an extremely humble king, as he wouldn't relish in the riches he had, as most royals would. Instead, he ate the same food as peasants and often would leave himself hungry in order to remember that he was in a position to serve his state. Okay, so you might be sitting there wondering when I'm going to get to the scary historical event you came to this video for, so here it is. As I mentioned before, he was able to lead his state to victory, but of course a war involves a lot of sacrifice and some pretty horrific happenings. The king's army was very well known for their ability to scare their enemies before a battle began, and this is because their front line consisted of criminals who had been sentenced to death. In this time, there wasn't lethal injection or the electric chair, so naturally it was a lot more of a vicious process. These criminals would decapitate themselves in front of the enemy army. Yep, I think this is probably the definition of a scary historical event. I can't even imagine witnessing something like that and then having to proceed with a battle against the army that has people doing that sort of thing. The king was certainly not a leader who wasted any time messing around. In our number five spot today, we have the hostage crisis. In 1980, America saw Ronald Reagan win the presidential election over former president Jimmy Carter, but there was a crisis going on that was taking the attention of Americans everywhere. The Iran hostage crisis is well known in American history and it began on November 4th, 1979 when 52 American diplomats and citizens were held hostage by a group of militarized Iranian college students who took over the US Embassy in Tehran. The 444 days these Americans were held hostage is something I'm sure a lot of Americans learned about at some point or another, but the release of the hostages is what sometimes gets a little murky in the history books. The hostages were released on January 20th, 19. 
1981, which was the day that Reagan was inaugurated. There were people who believed that the hostages were released because Reagan was simply just more powerful than Jimmy Carter. Basically what I'm trying to say is that Reagan received a ton of credit for the release of the hostages, but truthfully, it barely had anything to do with him. The Carter administration had been attempting to negotiate with them for months, but they hated Carter because he had provided aid to the former monarch of Iran and had also failed an attempt to rescue the hostages before. So while they certainly were released on inauguration day, it had way less to do with Ronald Reagan and more to do with them just absolutely hating Jimmy Carter. In our number fourth spot today, we have the zombie virus. I know The Walking Dead is a popular series, but none of us dream of living in that world. I mean, at least I hope not. What a literal nightmare. That is why in 2017, when the UK discovered that many of their caterpillars were falling victim to what became known as zombie virus, we all said we've had enough. Especially now that we've all gone through a pandemic. That kind of energy just needs to stay as far away from us as possible. The caterpillars were being infected with baculovirus, which stops their mold and encourages them to continue eating. Once they've eaten a bunch and they're full to the brim, the virus then tells them to head high onto a leaf, which like, if we weren't talking about a virus that's killing them, that would be like the cutest little sentence, just like, high on a little leaf. Anyway, it's not cute and it's sad. Basically, once on their leaf, if a bird doesn't snatch them up, warning, this is kind of gross, their body liquefies and explodes, and then the virus is spread onto the other caterpillars below. Yeah, see, let's all move on and forget it ever happened. Happened. The caterpillars are good, everyone's fine. In our number three spot today, we have the prohibition poisoning. I'm sure most of us learned about the prohibition at some point in school, which of course was the outlaw of the consumption of alcohol, which was done with a ban being placed on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcohol by the US government from 1920 to 1933. But it's just as well known that this ban certainly did not stop people from producing or consuming alcohol. It was just done in sneakier ways. The black market for alcohol was booming as people began to drink redistilled industrial alcohol instead. This is all pretty well known, but one super sketchy thing that is definitely less well known is something that government agencies did to curb the black market sales of alcohol. Basically, they poisoned the industrial alcohol that was being repurposed for drinking. And not just poisoned in a way where the drinker would get sick, which is already horrendous enough, but they poisoned the alcohol with lethal chemicals. It is thought that by the time the prohibition ended, at least 10,000 people died from this. This event is still one of the strangest and deadliest decisions made by government officials. In our number two spot today, we have the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. New York City's Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire in 1911 was an unbelievable terrible incident that led to changes being made for factory workers in America. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory was located on the 8th, 9th, and 10th floors of a building in Greenwich Village, and it of course was where shirtwaists were being made, which we would now call a woman's blouse. I call this place a factory, but it was definitely more like a sweatshop, and the employees were mostly comprised of young women. So like I mentioned before, in 1911 there was unfortunately a fire that broke out on the 8th floor, and because of the cramped and unsafe working conditions, the fire ended up claiming the lives of 146 people that day, which is just horrible. After more details came out about the incident and how terrible the working conditions were, protests broke out all around the city. People began demanding better for the women who had to work in these kinds of places. Like just as an example, the doors to the stairwells and exits were locked so that employees couldn't take unauthorized breaks. How unbelievable is that? And the worst part is that the owners of the company, who were largely responsible for what happened that day, basically basically just got off scot-free. In our number one spot today, we have internment camps. This is something that might be more well known than I think it is, but in my Canadian education, it wasn't something we talked about at all, which is kind of shocking. During World War II, President Franklin Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, which would cause 117,000 Japanese Americans to have to give up their homes, jobs, and businesses and move to internment camps. This was due to the fear of espionage after Pearl Harbor. This was truly one of the worst violations of civil rights in the 20th century and the government didn't apologize for it until decades later, but they cited national security as the justification for their actions. Unfortunately, this was only the beginning as other countries began to follow suit with Canada, Mexico, Peru, Brazil, Chile, and Argentina all having their own versions of the same kind of atrocity. It is very surprising to me that this isn't something that is discussed more often, as it of course is something that would prove detrimental to the Japanese American community for decades to come. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666.
1966. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and I'm immediately back inside. That's it, I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name, my lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references maybe, I don't know, it's kind of horrible. In the middle ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped and it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now the death toll here, I mean, obviously it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames. Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surnames were a little bit different. They were descriptions, almost, about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense, Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old, got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time, because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because you know he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others join in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks and the authorities tried their best to help the situation so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified. And once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise. Hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon 
carbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of face pareidolia? Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I like at our producer Chris, I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that. Cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly, it was far too cold for them to even stand a chance, and it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game, back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315, so only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine, countless lives were lost, and of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were, Horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Now yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, Plague Bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all of these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now, bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away and then they would bury them right just way over there great idea honestly the further the better couldn't agree more a church would house these plagued souls away from society now it sounds sad but this was the best call all things considered so no you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon and finally number one medieval punishment cleaner this one really sucks best for last here we go back in medieval times many executions were public the town would come out watch a hanging or two and then grab some bread and then head home they're like hey classic sunday this was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johann, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray ball. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. Starting us off is cutting edge courtship, quite literally in this case. It was traditional in some Nordic countries to have courtship customs involving knives and daggers. This is due to sacrificial nature in their original belief. The purpose of a dagger is prevalent for that after all, but it was also due to its functionality. In Finland, when a girl came of age, her father let it be known that she was available for marriage by providing her with an empty sheath. The girl would wear an empty sheath attached to her girdle, skirt. If a suitor liked the girl, he would put a pukoko knife in that sheath, which the girl would keep if she was interested in him. If she wasn't, she could just toss that anywhere. The knives were often custom, so a man would be able to woo a woman with unique details and imagery on a blade, but could also offer an heirloom or traded blade. Seeing as women of the Nordic region didn't shy away from handwork such as farming, jewelry making, clay working, etching, clothiers, and even some positions like smelting, a blade was a thoughtful and convenient 
convenient gift that also said, I love you a whole dagger's worth. Something so romantic about giving someone a gift they could quite literally kill you with. In the meantime, while the scans are giving blades, the English are being taught the no-no days and the no-no ways. In layman's terms, they were being told how to have intercourse and when. That just doesn't make for a fun title. You may be familiar with these laws and regulations. They've come up in some of our other medieval and middle age videos. This was a time period where the church had a lot to say in state affairs. Not to say that it doesn't now, but they were able to make determinations such as intercourse schedules around the religion. Real laws were in place that people could not have sex on Sundays, Thursdays, or Fridays due to religious reasons. Whenever a holiday had a fasting period, such as Lent, abstinence was expected then as well. If anyone was to deviate from the set rules by having intercourse, they were committing a grave sin. These laws were written in penentials, which were books that indicated what was allowed under the church rules and what was not. Oral, backdoor, premarital, and self-inflicted intercourse were banned in these books. Now thankfully their wide range taboos included some good stigmas to have, such as interbreeding, so that minimized people keeping it in the family and messing up our future populations. But even with sexual laws, men could be knaves, which is just an old timely way of saying being a dog. Now I'm not saying ladies couldn't have itchy feet and dog their way around too, we do it now and we've been doing it then, but it was a lot worse for ladies to be caught back then. So the general consensus is that it was rare and when it did happen it was usually affairs outside of a marriage. In general, young medieval daters had to be cautious. While peasant marriages were a little more than saying we're married most of the time, reputation, especially for a lady, was huge as was virginal status. Men of higher status often sought out beautiful peasant girls for affairs. Sometimes they benefited the woman greatly and she'd become an heir to a status child, thus elevating her own. But for the most part, it was pure carnal enjoyment men were after in a time when women were told to do the opposite. And so it became a game of men trying to win a single woman into doing the act. She had everything on the line while he usually had nothing. Secret flings were frowned upon to say the least and were often seen as a sign of potential trouble, hence the English ballad that would warn of knaves preying on young fair maidens at country fairs. A young woman caught having affairs was a wild scandal that could even be punished for or put to death, so making the decision to bow to a lord's or even a common man's pressure could quite literally destroy a woman's whole life and being. Yet it's still a decision women made. Ah, hormones. Yet when it comes to marriage, it's always love versus politics. Medieval marriages tended to be negotiations, particularly around dowry, but it wasn't all about money. It was very important that a noble woman is a virgin at marriage at purely out of pragmatic reasons. Marriage after all was an alliance union of two families that required healthy and admirable legitimate children to be truly locked in. It's for this reason as well as the violent men in society that the church laws stated that the degree of pressure to encourage a marriage could not sway a constant man or woman, aka no forced consent. What was forced however was up to debate, so don't be too proud of them for having that law in place. A woman was able to call off her marriage up until it occurred for this reason, as was a man. Should this occur, dowry was either returned in full or only partially as a fee for the failed union. Alongside this was the courtly love direction romance and marriage began to take in the middle mid ages, during a Shakespearean and theatrical influence. Marriage started to become idealized, we'll circle back to how this affected people later, but lower classes consistently did marry for love, since there is little to be gained materially from marrying for them. For most part there was no official ceremony that the social level marriage was more like hey we're married now and living together. By 1400 AD there were actually many laws decreeing marriages needed to start becoming a public affair, and one may wonder how often people did marry in secret. Next up, watch lords try to impress ladies with a lance measuring contest. As mentioned, courtly love and chivalry are important facets of medieval society and culture, and seeing as tournaments and displays of masculinity were centerpieces of this culture, it's no surprise it made its way into courting. By 12th century England, tournaments were in full swing, usually consisting of jousting and melees, a big organized throwdown between knights that were not expected to be dangerous but occasionally resulted in serious injury or death. These tournaments were respectable places to meet potential suitors and singles flocked to these spots to watch heroic knights joust and parade themselves around while noble maidens looked on adoringly. Some contemporary conservative commentators as well as the church however complained that the tournaments were places of frivolity, scandal and lust. Buzz kills. Don't worry, if sword fighting isn't your forte then poetry or songwriting were also popular ways to express your love to a lady. And remember, when meeting a beloved, 
dress to impress, but not so much that you cause a scandal. Remember, sumpter wearing laws exist. It'd be pretty embarrassing to be arrested and sentenced on your first date with someone. It was advised that medieval women getting ready for a date should wear their tallest steeple hat and their best dress, and top it off with their finest linen wimple. This helped to elongate the neck. A long neck on a woman was considered beautiful. So was a bunch of other weird stuff that we'll get to in a second. Meanwhile, men should always remember on a date to wear their best gown and hose, which are pantyhose. But as said, don't dress too posh. The sumptuary laws of medieval England, such as the statute concerning diet and apparel of 1363, tried to ensure that citizens did not dress or consume above their social status. These rules included what kind of fur trims could be worn and by whom, colors, hats, patterns, shoes, and all the whole shebang. Check out our video Top 10 Unusual Medieval Laws You Never Knew Existed to learn more about sumptuary laws and laws of fashion. The rules of etiquette will most definitely help you avoid scandal when invited over to the family home of your potential lover, and they were genuinely as follows. 1. Keep your hands clean. Don't stroke the dog or the cat. Be sure to wipe your fingers on the tablecloth instead of licking them. 2. Bones are not to be gnawed, and don't pick your teeth with the sharp irons. 3. Don't eat with a fork. Forks were used to prepare food, but most medieval Europeans thought forks were an odd thing to eat with. 4. Don't eat with a knife either. Many people carried the knives on them on their belt to carve up the food before eating, but don't eat with it. 5. Okay, if it's a liquid, use a spoon. People tended to eat with their hands for everything else. 6. Don't sit too close to the salt cellar. Salt was expensive and associated with prestige, so it's a good dating tip at a big dinner to see who sat closest to the salt cellar. And 7. You can burp, but look up at the ceiling as you do so. And 8. Remember, you must not urinate at the host's premises unless you're staying overnight and it's before bed. Obviously, some of these things like wiping your hands on a tablecloth, eating without a knife, or holding your pee until it's time to go are pretty unusual to us now. But back in the Middle Ages, if you wanted that shorty and not to ruin your reputation, well, you're burping at the ceiling, bro. I hope she's worth it. Next up is how love makes you crazy. This is a fascinating wormhole to travel down, and I learned from several journal articles that lovers in the Middle Ages had a real tendency to go mad. I mean, we all know the examples. Elaine, the fair maid of Astrolot pining away. Romeo and Juliet taking their lives and the raving madness of Ophelia, but these are just dramatizations, right? We tend to regard accounts of love madness in medieval literature as evidence that they overestimated the strength of erotic passion. In classical and early medieval periods, sexual love was regarded as carnal appetite to be controlled, but with the rise of poetry sentiment and the theater came courtly love, which was seen as a highly spiritual desire. The idea of courtly love had more to do with the concept of loving rather than pleasure. This idealized kind of love was based on a secret union where two lovers could only love from far away. These sorts of unattainable relationships were increasingly romanticized, but in medieval society, the notion that erotic love could drive people mad may not be so unrealistic. We understand now that mental illnesses are sometimes provoked by the stress between the individual and their social environment. Think of the pressure a woman had to marry. Her whole life is purely based on existing for marriage and childbirth. The headspace created would be incredibly vulnerable to valuing all self-worth off of said marriage. If she had no suitors or faces rejection and begins to start aging out of normal marrying age, these could be detrimental to her mind. Mental illness existed in the past. This level of self-worth being carried by societal pressure that also will punish a woman for her sexuality or existence of it should it be perceived as sinful or unwomanly is unbelievably stressful. So yeah, women primarily would literally be driven insane by marriage and their value being tied up in it. But it's okay to be crazy as long as you're hot. So let's follow these medieval beauty tips. These are actually documented tips I rounded up. So let's run through the list. First. Pluck your eyebrows and move your hairline back. A high forehead was considered attractive. One hair removal recipe was a vinegar mixture with ant eggs and ivy. Yum. Second, cancel all your Mediterranean trips. You need to whiten your face. Paleness was considered beautiful, and to achieve this, some women would apply mixtures to their skin, such as white lead powder mixed with sheep's fat. Weird. Third, while you're at it, hide those birthmarks and moles with homemade concealer. These blemishes were sometimes associated with witches in the Middle Ages. You may know this from our top 10 unspeakable things women went through in the Dark Ages video. One popular concoction was a face mask of bulls or hare's blood. Fourth, brunette is boring. Go blonde with organic hair dye. Flaxen hair for women was considered the most beautiful. Women who were not blonde could try a hair dye made from stale sheep's urine and saffron. If word of mouth wasn't enough to get these beauty tips to you, rest assured, Daniel of Beckles wrote a popular 13th century etiquette book. Regarding appearance, he said a man's hair should be neatly styled with a beard that was neither long nor shaggy and nails should be a attractive and teeth should be kept clean. How do you keep your teeth clean? One recipe for teeth cleaning in the middle ages was to mix sage leaves with salt, roll into balls, bake 
bake them into a powder and then rub them on the teeth. Sage advice indeed. And if you do not want to be a scandalous unmarried spinster, you better listen to it. And last but not least, don't forget to bring the hemlock. Whether you're two dirty knaves trying to get down lawlessly or a married couple who didn't want kids, hemlock was your best friend. So yes, while the medieval church made it clear that sex outside and for some clerics inside of marriage was sinful, the literary and documentary evidence suggests that these medieval Brits were still finding ways to be as randy as rabbits without an illegitimacy scandal. It was Hemlock, a recommendation made by 13th century author Peter of Spain in his book Treasure of the Poor. Peter wrote men should rub boiled paste of Hemlock on their boys before intercourse. Seeing as Hemlock is poisonous, this was ballsy. Obviously they were open to whatever suggestions they could get. When Persian physician Abba BMZ Razi works was translated, Europeans gobbled up his suggestions, which was applying cedar oil onto the nether regions before intercourse for a man or after for the woman. He also said that if the woman jumps backwards after intercourse, the uh, stuff will fall out. Seeing intercourse before marriage itself was illegal and knavery was perceived the way it was, I'm sure I don't need to explain the scandal. Number 10 Unsinkable Sam. Have you ever had a cat kind of look you up and down like expecting something? Like that, you know? Everyone has, why? Because cats are better than you. They were worshipped in Egypt for a reason. Cats can survive on the streets for days and then come back for cuddles when they want to. The tale of Unsinkable Sam is just another reason why cats are just ridiculous. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. He started out on a German warship called the Bismarck that he snuck aboard. That blew up along with 2200 men on board, but remarkably this cat was found by the HMS Cossack on a plank of wood. So the Brits took him and then their ship was attacked. Well Sam had to figure things out once again and this time the HMS Ark Royale found him chilling once again on some debris. Finally he earned the name of Unsinkable Sam. But it wasn't over for this little dude as a few months after that the Royale was torpedoed and Sam was saved again by the HMS Legion and by his sheer badassery. Finally they brought him ashore. <laughs> Poor guy. And this seafaring adventurer retired to land and later died in 1955. I don't know how well he recovered. <laughs> Check out this picture. Number 9. Interrogations Hans Scharf was living in South Africa with his family, but when he was visiting Germany, that's when the war broke out. He was drafted, but his wife convinced a general to not put him at the front lines, but instead with the interpreters. After a handful of pleasant mistakes and wild coincidences, Hans became the lead interrogator for the Allied pilots felled in France and Germany. His methods, though, changed history in a good way. When he was younger, he witnessed a prisoner get abused, so from that day on, he vowed to never do the same. So his interrogation methods revolved around using kindness and friendly banter. His method had been studied since, and it works even better, of course. This way, whoever's on the other side, they leak more information, and nobody has to break any fingers. Once the war was over, Scharf testified against Germans, moved to the States, and began a new career as a mosaic artist. His work is currently on display right now in Cinderella's castle at Disney World, so if you want to Take a good look. Go and buy a $90 ticket and look. Number eight, the limping lady. Her name, Virginia Hall. Permission to take down the Third Reich. Athletic, sharp, and funny, fluent in German, Italian, French, and a little Russian, Hall had all the makings to be a perfect spy. Born in Baltimore, Maryland to a wealthy family, she had no limits on where she would go, except for this. She applied to the US Foreign Service twice and was denied both times, firstly because she was a woman, and the second time because she was a woman and a cripple. She had accidentally mangled her left foot and had replaced it with a wooden prosthetic, hence the later name, the Limping Lady. She moved to Paris and one night at a cocktail bar she was rallying against the evil German leader when a woman handed her a card. The woman was none other than Vera Atkins, a British spy master believed to be Ian Fleming's inspiration for Miss Moneypenny and James Bond. Throughout the war, Hall was dubbed the most dangerous spy on the Allied force by the Germans. They hated her. Through guerrilla tactics, expert stealth communication, and disguise, she quickly became a legend. After the war, Hall was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, one of the highest US military honors for bravery in combat. Take that, Secret Service! Number 7. Operation Gunnerside. This next one should be a movie. It's already a movie? Damn it. Okay, back in 1943, the Germans were up to some things. We can't say certain words because of YouTube's stuff, but you get me, they were busy. In the early 40s, Germany took over a factory in Telemark so they could make plutonium. 
Originally, the Allies sent 30 British Army officers, but they couldn't make it due to weather conditions. So next, they sent 11 Norwegians with skis. That's apparently all it takes to sabotage the plan. This is amazing. Okay. The Norwegians snuck down a 660-foot ice gorge, snuck in, laid a bunch of explosives, waited for their hostage to find his glasses. He was a Norwegian caretaker. They let him go afterwards. Zero casualties in this entire mission, by the way. And then they left on skis. The one guy actually went back with his friends to sink a ferry. The Heroes of Telemark starring Kirk Douglas. Check it out if you want to see what I just said in action. Number six, the spy they didn't know they had. Another spy, but I spy spies. Not only did this dude fake his death for over 30 years, he was one of Britain's most crucial spies. He was so good, they didn't even know he was working for them. He was a veteran of the Spanish Civil War and loathed totalitarianism. He wanted to take dollar store Charlie Chaplin down. At the beginning of the war, Juan Pujol Garcia approached the British government about working as a spy against Germany for them, but he was rejected because he didn't have the credentials. So he just went ahead and did it anyway. On a flight from Madrid, he met some German officers and offered his services to spy against the British. They thought he lived in England. But the entire time, he was just living in Spain, feeding them false information. He just like pulled info from encyclopedias and advertisements to make them seem more legit. And he made mistakes like saying the Scots loved wine and the Germans still believed him. <laughs> Exactly, Scots loving wine, no way. He invented over 27 informants and spies that he received information from, therefore making him kind of like invaluable. He eventually approached Britain again to apply for the job he was already doing. They of course hired him and were like, dude, what? What? Okay, sure. Garcia also played a key role in D-Day by telling the Germans the plan was fake causing them to be unprepared for the day. After the war, he faked his own death until he was tracked down in the 1980s by a writer who was interested in telling his story and was like, I don't think this guy's dead, and then like went off and found him. That also should be a movie. Number five, Mad Jack. During World War II, you needed all the power you could get, but one man, Lieutenant Colonel Jack Churchill, AKA Mad Jack, had a different mindset when it came to battle and weaponry. He believed any British soldier going into battle without using a sword was improperly dressed. Also, fun fact about Mad Jack Churchill, he represented Great Britain in the World Archery Championships. So not only did he have a sword, but he also went into battle with a longbow, like he's Hawkeye. History has acknowledged Mad Jack as the last man to take out an enemy in combat with a longbow. That is a pretty wild achievement to have. But here's the most intimidating part about all this, if for some reason you're still not impressed. Before combat, right before, Mad Jack would play the bagpipes before drawing his sword and running into battle. That is the most badass thing I've ever heard. Imagine hearing bagpipes just coming from afar and then just hearing arrows flying in. I'd give up, here's the white flag. You earned it, Mad Jack, see ya. Number four, bat bombs. This sounds fake, but it is indeed true. Apparently bombs, artillery, tanks, were no longer like the in way to decimate your enemies. A dude in the United States thought he had a batter idea. Bat bombs are an experimental weapon developed in World War II, which was exactly as it sounds. The idea was that bats with bombs attached to them would swoop in behind enemy lines and decimate the enemy. Who was the genius behind this idea? A man by the name of Lytle S. Adams, and he was a dentist from Pennsylvania. The 60 year old tooth fairy was driving home from vacation when suddenly he was bombarded with brilliance. He witnessed thousands of bats exit the Carlsbad Caves, and when he heard about Pearl Harbor, he began planning. These tiny flying mammals could be connected to tiny time fused incendiary bombs and then released to land on the enemy. Just two months after Pearl Harbor, he presented the idea to the White House along with his oddball team. A pilot turned actor, an ex-gangster, and an ex-hotel manager to name a few. The project was greenlit, however the project was abandoned in 1943 due to the development of nuclear bombs. Number three, reindeer on a sub. 
June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history. And Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. They sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle. That was the only route, but of course, it was littered with U-boats. Thankfully, the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn, the Soviets were able to fight on. So as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, the World War II submarine, a gift. They sent him a live reindeer, six foot, real life reindeer. And the British had to accept because it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So they had to keep a six foot tall real reindeer on a submarine, a World War II submarine. Not even like a bigger, nicer one, just a little underwater. Her name was Pollyanna, and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was a crew member for six weeks. She slept better than most as well. She actually shared a room in the captain's quarters. Imagine the smell. Mm. Finally, the Trident returned home to Britain, and our leading lady was donated to the Regent's Park Zoo. All right, number two, the big dump. Like it or not, we've all been that person. The one to leave the bathroom a little more violent than you loved it. But I can't imagine anyone else in history of the world feeling more guilty than the one who sank a U-boat with his dump. That's right. Apparently it's not so easy relieving yourself miles below the ocean in a submarine. German U-boats had a two-valve system that only worked during shallow dives. But if you have a torpedo to drop of your own, time isn't always on your side. On April 14th, 1945, while 200 feet below, an unknown dumper caused a toilet malfunction, causing sewage and salt water to flood the compartment. The circuitry got fried, releasing chlorine gas, so they had to resurface. But when they did, they were spotted by the Brits and were attacked. Four of the crewmen died and the rest were captured, which I guess is how the story caught on. Imagine being the dude who dumped so hard he sunk a U-boat. And finally coming in at number one, Diamond Heist. Now most of these sound like movies, some of them are in fact already movies. This last one is absolutely insane. It should be a musical or something. It happened around May 1940 when Colonel Montague, nicknamed Monty, he was an undercover agent working for MI6. And when Germany was invading Amsterdam, he knew that big guns would eventually want to steal an extremely valuable amount of diamonds. So Monty, the quick thinker that he was, stole them first. You know, to keep him safe and to also look cool. He had gotten a key to the entrance of the Amsterdam diamond market, like literally he had a key, like it's Legend of Zelda, and then traveled to the building in regular human ordinary clothes, broke in, but he didn't know the code to the vault. He was looking back on past clues that he had acquired and he was working on getting in for about 24 hours straight. He literally heard Germans around the building and he got in the vault just in time. He completed his diamond heist, traveled all the way to England, and turned the diamonds over to the Dutch government. Starting off with some geography, we got Lake Nios. How can a lake kill 1,700 people? Well, though it sounds too insane to be true, it did indeed happen. Located in West Africa, the lake itself is deceptively beautiful. However, on August 21st, 1986, a mysterious cloud burst from the lake. It flooded towards the village and suffocated 1,700 people and animals, nothing survived the event. The reason this happened is because beneath the water there is a pocket of magma that leaks carbon dioxide into the lake. The CO2 stays dissolved in the water due to the pressure of the 650 feet of water on top of the magma secretions. Crazy, so kind of like a pop bottle with an invisible lid. Until one day, that lid popped. On that day, the lake abruptly depressurized and the CO2 exploded into the air, causing the devastating event. Today, pipes are used to siphon the CO2 out from the bottom of the lake in order to prevent this from happening again. But imagine when it did happen, it, it must have felt like some kind of magical grim occurrence, for, for sure. Number nine, the Salem Witch Trials. If you follow me on MA, you just know how much I hate the Salem Witch Trials. I hate them so much, okay? It's an event in history that is so inconceivably stupid, it's hard to believe it actually happened. The Salem Witch Trials occurred in Massachusetts between 1692 and 1693, where more than 200 people were accused of witchcraft and 20 were put to death. It all started because the daughter of Reverend Paris, Elizabeth, who was nine, and his niece, Abigail Williams, same age, started having fits. Another girl, Anne Putnam, age 11, started having them as well. The supernatural was blamed and soon the girls began accusing everyone they could, mostly people the town didn't like. 
Basically, if you confessed and you wanted to be saved, then you weren't executed, but if you were accused and didn't confess, you were killed. The paranoia was so bad that once you were accused, you couldn't escape this guilt they put on you. It was insane. But after the paranoia finally subsided, the colony admitted that they probably made a mistake and compensated the families. Like, yeah, oops, might have gotten a little carried away there. Wow, Whew. I got excited, sorry guys. Here's some money. The Salem witch trials today represent what happens when paranoia rules a courtroom and the whole thing still beguiles the world even 300 years later. Number eight, unsinkable Sam on a happier note. This is the kind of story that makes people believe that cats have nine lives. Unsinkable Sam was the nickname for a cat who survived several shipwrecks during World War II. His tale begins aboard a German warship called the Bismarck. Among the 2200 soldiers was a black and white cat that somehow snuck aboard. One day, the Bismarck was decimated during an attack, and while the HMS Cossack was looking for survivors, they saw Oscar the Cat, name of the time, seeking refuge on a plank, like Jack from the Titanic. They hauled him aboard, but then several months later, the Cossack would be decimated. That's shipwreck number two. This time, it was the HMS Arc Royale who spotted him, and was then dubbed the name Unsinkable Sam. And then, shipwreck number three. Months later, as you can guess, the Royale was torpedoed. And once again, Sam was saved by the HMS Legion of the British Royal Fleet. Finally, this seafaring feline retired to land and later died in 1955. Number seven, Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly is a woman right out of a Jules Verne novel. In fact, you would think so if she hadn't met the man himself. In 1889, Nellie Bly took on a record-breaking voyage by traveling around the world in just 72 days. Her means of travel included a train, a steamship, a rickshaw, horse, and donkey. Her goal was to beat the fictional record set by Verne's hero, Phileas Fogg, in his 80-day odyssey. An event like this already appeared as a myth to the men of the time. Her editor at the New York World nearly refused to send her because her gender would make the trip impossible. No one but a man could do this, he told her. Very well, she replied. Start the man and I'll start the same day for some other newspaper and beat him. He backed down and eventually Nellie was on her way, turning fiction into reality. Number six, the Black Museum. No, I'm not talking about the Black Museum episode of Black Mirror, but honestly, not too far off. People have done some pretty vicious things to their enemies. There's a long list, but imagine turning your enemies into a permanent dinner guest because that's exactly what Ferdinand I of Naples actually did. Though everyone thought he was going to be a great king, he actually ended up being pretty psychotic. He would invite his enemies over for dinner, and while they gorged on pheasant, he would take them out, either the old-fashioned way, or literally throw them out of a window. He would then retrieve and dress the bodies and stage them. He called it his black museum and would invite new acquaintances to view it so they would know exactly who they were dealing with, so not to mess with him. What a psycho. Number five, Sir Adrian Cotton de Watt. Love that name. There are gonna be a couple unbelievable events on this list from World War II, so just a heads up. But truth be told, the war itself is kind of hard to believe. Sir Adrian Cotton de Watt was not only a man who survived the impossible once, but he made a career out of it. He wasn't like your black adder general in the back with a pipe. This dude was on the front lines tossing grenades with one arm because he already lost the other. He served in the Boer War, World War I, and World War II. He survived being shot in the face, skull, hip, leg, ankle, and ear. One eye and one arm short, this enthusiastic war hero dove into the bloodshed again and again. He was seen pulling pins out of grenades and throwing them with his one good arm during Battle of the Somme. But even as a 60 year old man, he was still a beast. His plane got shot down in April 1941. He crashed it into the Mediterranean, survived, swam all the way to shore. Then he got captured by Italian soldiers, thrown into a POW camp. Then he escaped, eluded capture for eight days, but unfortunately the lack of Italian looks gave him away. He was released two years later and Churchill was such a big fan of him, he made him his rep over in China. He ended up passing away peacefully at age 83 despite hundreds of close calls with death. Number four, 
Simo Heha. This is actually kind of a plug for a short film I'm looking to raise funds for. Check out my Instagram to learn more. But his story is incredible and it's so unbelievable. Simo Heha's story sounds like something straight out of a movie, except it actually happened. A humble Finnish farmer who became the Soviet's nightmare in World War II. He is widely regarded as one of the most accomplished and skilled snipers in history. The Winter War began in Finland in 1939 after Russia decided that it was time to regain some territory. They thought it was going to be easy. But soon they came to fear the man who would be known as the White Death. He was trained as a sniper at a young age, didn't want to take human lives though, so he just became a farmer, but the lives of his countrymen were at stake. The Winter War lasted just over 100 days and within that time, Simo hit as many as 500 men, his personal best being 40 confirmed hits in one day. Some people estimate that it was over 800 people. In March 1940, he was hit in the jaw by a counter sniper, leaving him in a coma for 11 days. But when he awoke, however, the Russians surrendered. That is poetic justice. Number three, Alexander the Great. How did this guy exist? Was he the son of Zeus? The case is so convincing that even Alexander believed it himself. During the 15 years of his conquest, starting from his first victory when he was 18, Alexander never lost a battle. He was so prolific in battle that his strategies are still studied to this day. Before Alexander entered Egypt, they had been under Persian rule for just over 200 years. Through his incredible prowess and lightning quick decision making, Alexander defeated them. Egypt was so happy they even claimed him as their pharaoh. While he was in Egypt, however, Alexander decided to make the long trek to visit the shrine of Zeus Ammon. According to the man himself, he was guided there by ravens and it even rained during his journey which was interpreted as a blessing. When he got there, the priest named him a son of Zeus. Now if that doesn't make this guy sound like a myth, then I I don't know what will. Number two, Bodicea. Bodicea is the Morrigan in my mind. She is Xena, warrior princess. This woman was so ferocious, she was called the scourge of the Roman Empire. Yeah, that's right, this queen took on the Roman Empire. At the time Rome was invading the south of Britain, Queen Bodicea ruled the Inseni tribe of East Anglia along her husband, King Prasutagus. Though her early days remain mostly a mystery, she remains among the canon of heroes who defended the British Isles. She was fearsome to behold, with flaming red hair and a gaze so sharp it could cut glass. She and her husband fought against the Romans until his death, after which the Romans drove straight to take her on. They attacked her daughters publicly, which like mother bear, not a good idea, after which she toured in a chariot rallying the people in rebellion. She sat three Roman cities and took no prisoners. She annihilated the 9th legion when she took out their entire relief force. Sadly though, Bodicea fell after a vicious battle, but her name echoes in the halls of heroes. And last but not least, Richard, Saladin, and the Third Crusade. Just the Crusades in general are just unbelievable. Never in history have two rulers been so equally matched. Currently I'm reading Warriors of God, Richard the Lionheart, and Saladin and the Third Crusade by James Rustin. And the fact that everything I've read so far like, isn't just the next Game of Thrones novel astounds me. These two never met because Saladin believed that kings should not go to war if they had met, but because they were fighting over the Holy Land, war was kind of inevitable. But while Saladin did not engage in warfare, Richard dove right in the middle of everything. They both had such incredible admiration for each other that in the middle of battles, they would send each other gifts. Like, I don't understand. You killed my men. You killed my men. Here's a fruit basket. Literally happened. And another example, during the Battle of Jaffa, Richard's horse ended up being killed and Saladin was so impressed with him that he sent him two new ones. Two! On top of that, Richard had taken off half of his armor before he had left to shore to fight. So he was like, basically like, half naked. Huh. Eventually Saladin tried to have him assassinated, but Richard was so ferocious in battle that everyone feared him. The dude was pretty much a human bulldozer. The two assassins ended up waking up the camp because they were fighting about who should take the guy out. 